to have, what do we like, you know, 20 people, 25 people uh, to come on Wednesday of eighth week when you're all pretty exhausted from, I'm sure, a big term, and, uh, and come to a rowing seminar, which uh, is something I don't think the club has a hello, posterity. Uh, are you feeling me, man? I don't think we've ever done it before as a club. Um, I'm Chris, by the way. Um, I have a too long affiliation with the, the rowing club. Um, I stroked M1 to Blades in 2011, uh, and I coached M1 to Blades this year at uh, some rate. So I'm one of the few Antonian rowers who can cross his blades, which I intend to do as soon as I have like a, a den to, yeah, it's all planned out, it's going to be awesome. Yeah, my man cave, it's going to rock. Um, but uh, I mean, and so I've been finishing a bunch of personal projects, and so I've just been completely uh, disengaged from, uh, from the club the last couple months. But you know, I've been watching from the sidelines because my flat is right on the water. Um, and, and just so inspired to see like you know, six crews from the men and the women in Christchurch, and just so many people who, who, who want to row. Um, and so also because I might be not around uh, next term, I wanted to take a, a moment and just try to you know, pass on some, some thoughts and ideas that might be helpful for you guys as you go forward into your rowing careers. Um, but also, I kind of felt it ended up being sort of timely that, you know, you've had, I guess, yeah, for mostly everyone here, it's sort of your first term of rowing. You, you've learned a lot. You've tried a lot. You know, you've had different coaches poking and prodding you with different ideas and stuff. And just to be able to take a step back from it all and to help us all get onto the same page in terms of, uh, you know, what is... What are we trying to do here? What is it to go from being a novice to a competitive rower? You know, what are the major kind of training and learning goals uh, you need to accomplish, and what's the way to getting there? So I thought I, maybe I've got sort of like 10 to 20 minutes of real content. In true Oxford fashion, I have no idea how long that means in real life. But in my head, I've got like 10 to 20 minutes of real content where I just want to sort of lay out that one page that I hope we can all get on, um, and then I'm happy if you know if I've left any time for questions in my seminar, uh, for like whatever questions uh, you might have just from that first term of trying things out. Um, I might have some ideas, I might have some answers, I might not, um, but I probably have at least some experiences uh, that I might be able to share. Sound good? Okay. Um, so. I guess the first thing, just because I'm a bit obsessive compulsive, so for me I kind of move from first principles down to you know, specific details. Why do we row? I think is a, is a, a good starting point. And why does rowing matter? And the only thing I figured out over five years of doing it is that it doesn't matter. <laughs> it really doesn't matter to most people. You know, there are not lives on the line here. Uh, chances are that whatever glories you obtain at Oxford Rowing will not receive their due regard um, outside of Oxford. So, so it doesn't matter, but if you, if you commit yourself to the task of learning how to row well, of learning how to be competitive, of trying to win, then it will matter to you. And I can tell you, it does matter to me how you perform as a club come torpids, come summer eights. Why? I can't explain that. There's no rationale for it, but it does. Because I worked very hard to help get the men's boat to where it is on the river today. You know, and Chris can say that, and Dan can say that. You know, blood and sweat went into getting it where it is. It matters to us. And if you commit yourself to trying to take that boat and move it up the river, it will matter to you, but it will also matter to you know, a couple of decades of rowers who understand what it takes and understand that commitment that you took it on board as well. <coughs> so it's kind of a very insular clubby thing, is what I'm trying to say. And it'll only make sense why you spend so much time doing it if you really commit to trying to do it well. Okay? So that, that's number one. The second is, um, 
What is the task of learning to row well, of becoming a, a competitive rower? And broadly, it comes down to two aspects. There's a mental aspect, and there's a physical aspect. Okay, the mental aspect, and this is what, you know, in the few times that I've been on the the path coaching, I'm, you know, I'm trying to sort of see where people are at in the process, I imagine, and then take them to the next step. And different people are at different stages of the process, so sometimes it's difficult to, to coach the crew. But what I want to do in this book is sort of step back and explain what is the broad process. So the, the broad process, the mental aspect of rowing, is, is pretty straightforward. One is coming to understand what ideal rowing looks like, what the ideal stroke is. So that's one, getting this, this ideal clearly in your head. Two is coming to understand how you individually diverge from that ideal. And that's a, a, not just a, a process of having it said to you, but a process of developing the body awareness to recognize, okay, the ideal should look and feel like that, but I'm actually doing something different. And developing that awareness of what you are just doing now so that you can understand how you diverge from the ideal, that takes time. That takes mental concentration. Once you get to stage two, then stage three is to converge upon the ideal. Yourself individually, but also together as a crew. And the important thing about that, sort of all those three tasks, I think to understand, but especially the third, because you can, you can get a very clear idea after some study and concentration and work of what the ideal should be. You can get a very clear idea of how you don't match it. You can watch a video and stuff like that. But getting yourself converging to that ideal as an individual and as a crew is a never-ending process. It's a quest for perfection that you never arrive at. So maybe, you know, after one month of rowing, you're sort of, you know, 10% of the way there. And maybe if you work hard and concentrate and make every stroke and every repetition and every urge session a learning experience, you get to 50% by corporate or summer rates. But it could be, you know, there's always room to learn. And so you're always mentally engaged in that aspect of your training because you know that you can always get better. Okay. So I just want to show you, uh, I want to show you what kind of the learning progression in the mental focus looks like. So I've got, this is, is this showing up? All right, excellent. Look at this, audio visual. <laughs> oh, we, 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 we've arrived as a club, this is great. So this is, I don't know what day this is, but this, I think, is one of the men's crews that I just pulled this up. Christchurch. Uh, Christchurch. Christ 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 like, uh, or St. John's. Elementary. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No. That. I mean, again, for where we're at in the process, I think that's really good. But in terms of understanding, you know, what's the ideal? How do I diverge from the ideal? Converging as a crew toward the ideal that's maybe like 10% of the way there, okay? Now, let me show you. Uh, so this is, uh, yeah, the, uh, so M1 this summer, Blade Winning Crew, this is uh, their Friday race. Uh, and I would describe this crew as like 50 to 60 percent toward the ideal. Um, the ideal is both physical preparedness and, and that, that singular understanding of the ideal stroke. And this crew, I think, scored really high on the physical preparedness. And it was, I was always working, I needed more time. I was trying to get them more towards the, but okay, this is that. 
So there's a lot of steel. You look at the blade heights. There's some variation there. There's movement, squaring at different times. What's harder to see is the efficiency and the strength of the drive phase for them was really, really good. Really, really good. Um, but I would say that's about sort of 50 to 60 percent. Uh, now this is maybe me being a bit... <laughs> okay. So this is um, me and a crew that was training for Head of the River. This, I guess it was March this year. Head of the River is Europe's largest regatta. It happens on the Tideway in London each year. It's the same course as the boat race between Oxford and Cambridge, but it's rowed in reverse. So we were training for that. It's a 7K race. Um, <laughs> just notice, I mean, just the general sensation of people moving together. The arms are moving together, the bodies are rocking forward together, the legs and the back yeah. rocking together. I would say, so all of us, I mean, we came together, we'd only been rowing together for a couple of weeks. But we had all individually been rowing for a while. So we came into that crew, which was new for all of us, having a pretty strong idea of what rowing should look like. And once we were together in a crew, it was just making smaller adjustments around, OK, you know, this stern pair, how fast are their hands moving away? You know, how much do they rock their body? We all had a very similar idea. So it didn't take a long time to get together to a reasonable, steady platform. I would say that was about. 70% of realizing the, the ideal. Uh, I fished around on YouTube, and this was the best that I could find in my judgment. Okay. Uh, so these guys are in a four, not an eight. And I would say that this is, I'm, just get, I'm going to show you a side angle in a moment, but I would say this is what 95% of realizing converging on that singular ideal would look like. Not here, just watch the other angle in a moment. Here. This is 95. So the point is with these guys, <coughs> they have so singular an idea of what they should be doing and how to do it that they mirror one another so easily that they can be moving at a very slow, relaxed speed and the boat is always strongly, strongly balanced. There's, a, there's almost eerie similar, yeah? Yeah, yeah, not bad. So the point is, <coughs> and that's the mental side of rowing, right? That is understanding what is the ideal, understanding how do I diverge from it, figuring out with your coach how to converge closer to it individually and together as a crew. And you can work on that, work on that, work on that, every outing, every training, and you will probably never get to that. <laughs> But every step closer along, you know, every additional percentage point of having and then laying down that singular ideal is satisfying, is the point. So that's the mental aspect. And so when you come to the water, when you go on the erg, I want you to kind of have, you know, if you choose to really commit to this, the, the hunger to, to get closer to that ideal. That's why, you know, when people are late, I harp on that. You know, I want you to be more concentrated right, to your rowing. You know, I want you to be thinking hard, you know, when someone's explaining to you a concept. To try, you know, when you're given a drill, to try it out, to, 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 to feel it out, to discover new awareness and feeling through the training that you're doing so that you get closer and closer to that. Right? 
So it's just to, to visually have an impact, you realize that, that it's, it's not about being kind of in time together. It's about trying to get perfectly in time. And the closer you get to that, the more you're going to look like that. Okay? So that's the, that's the mental aspect of rowing. And then the other half of it is the physical aspect. So between now and your next regatta, in, in addition to trying to get closer and closer to that, and having that mental focus to try to improve your rowing, you also need to make a physiological change, like a real physical change to be competitive, especially if you're going for the men's or women's first boat, which is competing in, in Div 3. Right? So the thing about rowing, it's kind of fun. So, Right, you know there's, there's aerobic activity and there's anaerobic activity, right? So aerobic activity, you know, we take carbs and fats, we mix it with oxygen, we produce muscular energy and water and CO2, sweat and then breath, right? That's aerobic exercise, okay? <coughs> anaerobic exercise is when there isn't enough oxygen present to convert the carbs and fats to energy. Instead, your body, instead of using oxygen, ferments them. It ferments the sugars in your body and produces energy for your muscles that way. The challenge with fermenting is that one of the byproducts is lactic acid, okay? And lactic acid, lactate, is what makes your muscles burn and sore and everything is painful. And eventually, if the lactic acid builds up, to a high enough concentration in your blood, you shut down. Your effort goes down to a level that the body can tolerate. It brings more oxygen in at a lower level of effort to flush the lactic acid from its system. To row competitively, you need to boost your, your hearts and your lungs, your ability to oxygenate your blood, and you need to raise what's called the anaerobic threshold. You need to raise the point of physical effort at which aerobic switches to anaerobic. And you need to develop a tolerance to just endure the lactic acid in your system and get better at flushing this acid out. All of that means, all is just to say, and one of the most common things I told everyone, I think last year when I was coaching, that rowing is a fair sport. And one of the reasons I love it most is that ultimately what happens in a regatta reflects the concentration and the effort you put in and the time that led to that regatta. Because you must develop this, you have to get towards this, and you must make a physiological change in your body. And you can't just fake it on the day. You have to work every day to develop those changes, you know, the mental and the physical, in order to deliver it. Uh, so I just wanted to show on the physical side, <coughs> um, has some of you I know have seen this video that I showed a brief clip of, which was one of the men's races um, last year. I don't know who has seen the races in full. Watch them in full. This, this video. Yeah. yeah, okay, I just want to show you, maybe we can watch it in, in full, not to labor the point. But all I want you to just spend some time noticing is the level of energy, of effort, the high level of effort, and how sustained that effort is. So when you're racing, in the first maybe, depending on your fitness, 30 seconds to maybe a minute, it's aerobic. You've got oxygen in your blood, and you're just burning through an aerobic process. By about the one minute point, your body is reaching the anaerobic threshold, especially if you're rating as hard as they are. And from then on, it's a, it's a, it's a battle between the effort that the crew is demanding of you 
the effort that the race is demanding of you and your body telling you that it wants to stop. It wants to back down on the effort so it can return to an aerobic pace. And we have to learn to just stay on that red line. Stay on that red line. And she said, if it goes below 34, I'm going to force you to push it up. I'm going to keep it on the red line. This is also what the cox has to do in a race. Because, you know, now we're into minute two, and I just don't want to do it anymore. And I don't see my opponent. In this case, they know that it's about 100 meters behind them. You need somebody to help you, just keep you committed to staying on that anaerobic threshold. You can see it's dipping a bit. The rate's gone down. You already closed it. Patient on the slide. Nice. Legs, hips. Legs, hips. Just your spoon in the water. I want you to sit up for 10 strokes. Sit up. One, two, sit tall. Three, tall. Four, up. Legs. On the line. Half a minute, rest, and then. Mm. They're like three and a half minutes in now. To be able to dig and find more effort. So they didn't do it. So she calls for it again. And this is a, a program of erging that is a lot of long ergs, long, slow ergs to strengthen the heart and develop the body's ability to just flush lactic acid in a nice regular process and then a lot of shorter sprint pieces to build up lactic acid in the system and then just practice pushing while the lactic acid is still in your system. So they took the gap by this point between them and their opponent from about 120 meters to about 30. If you have a serious intention of competing for blades, as a crew, you have to have this in your pocket. You have to have the capability to reach for a crew that is still racing, maybe far down the river. And in particular, as you come down green banks, that's where crews that haven't trained to that level tend to taper off. And it's four minutes in and they're just tired. If you have the fitness to keep your effort at a high level through green banks, that's often where you can make some major gains on crews in front of you. Ha, ha, ha.
<laughs> I'm so glad that uh, that these guys have video of this. Um, it's a real, you know, it's a special memory for them as a crew that they have video of each other races. Um, and when they won blades, so one of the traditions in the boat club is that you have uh, like a formal dinner to, to celebrate your blades. And um, when I stood up there to say a few words, I said to them, uh, I am not now sorry that I pushed you as hard as I did. And, and the point is that, you know, s the ecstasy for them was because they, they worked so hard to reach a point where they were able to do that, right? They were technically good enough to win a race quickly against a weak crew. You know, they had that, they had a strong ideal, a strong singular vision of what the stroke should be. And they had done enough technical training to be able to lay that down so they were efficient. But they were also fit enough, they had trained hard enough, that if the situation called for it, they could reel in a crew from a football field length away. Right? And that, <clears throat> it was uh, later in the process than you guys are now. But they sort of had set their vision that they wanted to have blades. And I said, you know, at this point, anything is possible. The most valuable resource you have, and this is exactly true for you guys in this room right now, the most valuable resource you have right now, if you have an ambition to perform at a high level in the regattas, is time. Because you can convert this time into making good choices, into being concentrated in your training, into getting really engaged mentally in your training, into doing the long ergs to develop your aerobic capacity, and doing the sprint ergs to develop your tolerance for the lactic acid and be able to flush it from your system. You can do all of that right now. Tomorrow, you have a little less time. And the day after that, you have a little less time. And to keep in mind that there are other crews and other colleges that are choosing to convert that time into mental and physical gains. Right? So it's kind of, that's your most valuable resource. That's the resource that you have to cherish and use wisely and make good choices and commit yourself. Especially now with the holidays coming up. Right? If you want to be competitive in torpids, somehow you have to return to Oxford fitter than when you left it. Right? You may not have access to an ERG, it doesn't matter. Everyone can jog anywhere, but you have to commit that I'm going to return to Oxford fitter than I left it. Because when you get back, you know, two months have passed, and if you let that time pass and you haven't converted it into, you know, higher skill or fitness, then again, I said, rowing is such a fair sport. It will not give it to you freely. You can't get that time back once you've spent it. And especially if you're here for a one-year program, you don't have a lot of time to, you know, to, to try it all again next year. So a sense of urgency as well, I think, is really important. That's kind of all I had. That's, how did I do? Was that 20 minutes? 28. Ha! Axie. I should be a professor here. Um, <laughs> but does that, does that make sense? There's this mental aspect. It's really important. The ideal, how you diverge from it, converging together on that ideal. And then, you know, just the fair physical aspect. The need to become aerobically fit, to be tolerant of lactic acid in your system so you can hang on that red line if you need to for seven or eight minutes. And that's it. And you have time to do all those things if you choose to. Questions? Dan? Yeah, I got a question. What, tell me the difference between torpids and summer eights and, and the, the setup for that race. And okay. How do you mentally sort of prepare for that? I mean, torpids traditionally.